Okay, well, good afternoon. I uh, just thought I'd start with a song there. Uh, let me hit the live transcript and we'll get that going. <clears throat> so just a few reminders um, for this morning or this afternoon. Would, um, homework on climate change was due on Monday. Uh, if you've asked for the grace period, it's due tonight. If you still need time, um, to finish it, just let me know and I will work with you. Uh, if you forgot to do participation question seven, just email me and I will reopen that for you. Uh, homework on Clean Air Act and meteorology is open and that it will be due on March 15th with the same um, grace period of 48 hours. If, you're in, if you need it, just again, let me know. And participation question eight will actually open uh, tomorrow. And then project two is um, due on March 22nd, and I will provide a 72 hour grace period if you need that, so just let me know. I've posted a number of scholarship opportunities. I've actually also posted a number of internships and jobs, student assistant positions at Eagle all on the e, e blog. There is actually a separate post for scholarships and a separate post for jobs and internships. So check that out. Um, there's a link to the blog online Kappa. And we got an email uh, this morning that there will be an in-person commencement. It will be May 2nd um, and it will be by department. So chemical engineering will have their commencement with material science and biosystems and civil and environmental engineering will have their commencement uh, separately. You need to apply for graduation. So if you haven't applied for graduation and you think you're graduating this semester or planning to graduate this semester, make sure you process that form um, because you won't get an email, you won't get the information, you won't get the tickets because it will be a ticketed event. Um, and you won't get that unless you have applied for commencement. So good news that there will be an in-person commencement uh, this semester. Any questions before we move on? Okay, we left off talking about uh, formation of clouds. And these are some images from this morning. They're actually from White Lake, Michigan. And the reason that I used White Lake is because there is a weather station at White Lake um, and I could get the information um, that I was looking for for White Lake. So these are just a few um, images. Um, the one on the left is from the MDOT uh, camera. And the one on the right half is just a local. Um, so what do we see in terms of the clouds? Type of, we, talk, we looked at cloud, um, different types of clouds. Um, what are these low lying clouds, high, medium? What do you think? Okay, we got one low. I would say so. Um, I'm not an expert, um, but I would call them stratus clouds. Um, stratus meaning strata or layer and low lying clouds. So we can actually look at a plot as we looked at um, on Monday of the dew point. So from the sounding data, I was able to download actually both the temperature versus elevation data, and I should have labeled this with the altitude. 
So what I've plotted is altitude versus temperature in degree C, and we have altitude in meters. And I apologize, I should have labeled that. So the purple line is the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So I've just calculated the dry adiabatic lapse rate <clears throat> starting at six degrees. So ground temperature is six degrees. And I've also plotted the dew point. And what you see actually is it looks like there's crosses maybe here. It's not a real, um, let's see this, this is the line. Your data is never anywhere near as um, nice, I'll call it, um, as what normally one sees in all of these um, kind of cartoons that you see in textbooks. So they're never textbook. Um, but what you see is the cross where the, where the line for the dew point and the dry adiabatic lapse rate crosses over about a thousand meters. So it's low lying clouds. Um, we can, <clears throat> oops, I thought I had um, added another figure in here, um, <clears throat> which actually had the temperature um, where I plotted the temperature. And actually, if you plot the temperature, it actually looks something like this. So the temperature, if I plot the actual, this would be the environmental lapse rate. So if I were to plot the environmental lapse rate, it the temperature actually increased initially and then starts to decrease. So <clears throat> what you see here okay, is this significant uh, difference in how the temperature and the dew point both behave. Now, we started the lecture looking at transport and thinking, wanting to, what we need to be able to do is use this information in order to predict how pollutants will move in the atmosphere. And we started with these same images where we looked at two different, very different weather conditions with different wind conditions, and you can see the very different plumes. And we'll talk about plume rise, and you can see this plume rise here. Okay, so you see this plume rising before it starts to disperse in a horizontal direction. On the other hand, on March 2nd, 2015, there's almost no plume rise at all. We need to be able to predict that, and we need to be able to predict how this plume will move so that we have an understanding of how that plume, how these pollutants will affect human health and the environment. So what we will look at is what we refer to as the stability of the atmosphere. So we've been talking about this rising air parcel. So we've talked about this in terms of the dry adiabatic lapse rate or the moist adiabatic lapse rate. If the parcel is colder than the environment, it tend, that parcel tends to want to go down. If the parcel is warmer, it tends to want to rise. So we'll see that here. In this case, we'll look at the situation where we have an environmental temperature. So this is what we were to actually measure the temperature, the sounding information that I provided, um, that I graphed, is, actu is actual data. So we can see at the surface, it was this case, it's 20 degrees. At 1,000, it's 15, 10, 5. Okay. 
So this is the environmental lapse rate. Now, we can also use that ground temperature in order to determine the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So we'll start at the same temperature, start at 20 degrees. We'll use the dry adiabatic lapse rate, that 10 degrees C per kilometer decrease. And based on that, we can then calculate that temperature at any elevation or altitude. Now, in this case, the way this is drawn, clouds form at 2,000 meters. So at altitudes above 2,000 meters, we'll use the moist adiabatic lapse rate, the minus 6.5 degrees C per kilometer. And that will, we can then use that to predict the temperature on this moist adiabatic lapse rate. What we're comparing is we're always comparing our hypothetical parcel with the environmental lapse rate. So in this case, for all of these conditions, the, this is our parcel, so this is our balloon. The temperature in the parcel or the temperature in the balloon is less than the, the environmental temperature. So we've got some difference. It's always less than. Which means that the balloon wants to do what? Does it want to rise, sink, or stay where it is? So we've got one for rise, we've got one for sink. Anyone else? So the balloon's temperature is less than the environmental. It wants to sink. So it's going to tend to want to sink. Because of that, we will describe the atmospheric condition as stable. And this is referred to then as absolute stability because it is always less than the parcel temperature is always less than the environmental temperature. Did include it, I forgot where I put it. Okay, here is the data that I was mentioning. So here I plotted temperature in degrees C versus altitude in meters. And what you see here so this is our dry adiabatic lapse rate. That's our balloon. Notice here, the temperature, as I mentioned before, actually increases at lower altitudes and then decreases. Is this a stable or an unstable condition? So this is our balloon. Here's our balloon. So. It's a stable condition, exactly, because your balloon temperature is less than the atmospheric temperature. You actually what will, this, <clears throat> in lower altitudes, it's actually an inversion because the temperature is actually increasing with altitude instead of what we would expect, get a decreased in ten pressure, we expect a decrease in temperature as <clears throat> that as we increase altitude. So as I mentioned, this was data from this morning. We can also look at instability. Now here, same thing. Now, in this case, this is the environmental temperature. We start at 40 degrees C, so it's really warm day. 
and we have temperature is decreasing with altitude. So we can plot the environmental lapse rate. It's the purple line here. We'll do the same for the adiabatic lapse rate. So we start at 40. We use the 10 degrees C per kilometer decrease for a dry adiabatic lapse rate. And you can see it's 30 degrees C at one kilometer, 20 degrees C at two kilometers. Clouds form at two kilometers. And then here we're going to use the moist adiabatic lapse rate of 6.5 degrees C per kilometer. Now, in this situation, here's our balloon. Draw the balloon. Does the balloon want to rise or sink under this situation? It wants to rise, exactly. Temperature of my balloon, my parcel of air, is always greater than that of the environment, so it wants to rise. We can also talk about a conditional atmosphere. Here. We have the environmental temperature. So we'd get this from the sounding data that I plotted. And again, we've used the dew point to determine where clouds form. We then again use the dry adiabatic lapse rate up to the point where clouds form and the moist adiabatic lapse rate above that. We plot both. So the environmental lapse rate is again your purple line. And the red and blue are the line for the adiabatic lapse rate. So notice here, here's my balloon. What does my balloon want to do under these conditions? So it's going to want to fall, so it's stable, up to right here. And now it wants to rise. So this is referred to as conditional instability. So we have the situation where you see this crossover. We can also talk about neutral stability. And here, the dry air is neutrally stable if the environmental lapse rate is equal to the dry adiabatic lapse rate. If those are equal, then it doesn't want to doesn't want to rise or fall. If we have saturated air, then we'll use the moist adiabatic lapse rate. And in this situation, the air parcel neither tends to rise nor sink if it's left on its own. So this is referred to as neutral stability. So we also use the term super adiabatic lapse rate, which is an unstable. So in the previous one, question here. OK, so here is the environmental. So it tends to sink here. So the question is, what would that look like? In this case, we have a smokestack here. Smokestack is going to be below this 3,000 meter. So basically, what you're going to have is essentially, kind of think of it almost as two different atmospheric conditions. So you'll get mixing typically, it's going to kind of just stay in this region here. If something, pollutants are up in the upper, I'll call it, it's not really the upper atmosphere, but in this upper region, they'll tend to stay mixed there and they'll tend to disperse. So you're not going to get a lot of dispersion 
within this roughly 3,000 meter sort of altitude, and you're going to get a lot more dispersion above that. So you can almost get this divide in two different atmosphere conditions. That's going to change the way your pollutants migrate and the way that they behave. You're not going to get the dispersion. Does that make sense? You're not going to get the dilution of those pollutants in the atmosphere. So as I mentioned, we also talk about a super adiabatic lapse rate and a sub adiabatic. So sub is stable, super is unstable. And we can think about that if we plot altitude versus temperature. And this, we'll just do it for a dry adiabatic lapse rate. So this is our dry adiabatic lapse rate. This is the environmental lapse rate, call it environmental lapse rate one. Here, is this stable or unstable? Stable or unstable? It's unstable, exactly. Here's my balloon. Temperature of the balloon is always greater than that of the, envir the environment. So it wants to tend to rise. So this is a super adiabatic condition and it's unstable. Here, we have environmental lapse rate two. So this is sub adiabatic, tends to want to sink, so it's stable. And then if my environmental lapse rate fell right on this line, that would be ELR3, and we'd have a neutral condition. So this table is actually from the FE Handbook version 10.1. I just thought I would add this in there just to same information. It just provides you with this information in a form that you would see it on the FE uh, reference handbook. Now we can also talk about mixing depth. And I mentioned this before with that one example. And think of this here is we have an environmental lapse rate. So the light blue uh, the turquoise line is the environmental lapse rate. So the temperature is decreasing with altitude up to a point, and then it starts to increase. And we have then a dry adiabatic lapse rate because we'll say clouds form up here. Now, what we're looking for here then is the point where the dry adiabatic lapse rate crosses the environmental lapse rate. And typically what is used here is the average maximum surface temperature for the month that you're looking at. Remember, you're modeling this. There's no way to model it for absolutely every condition. So what is done is use the maximum surface temperature for that particular month. And we'll then look, determine where this line crosses. And that will give us the maximum mixing depth. So if we have a plume here, we can think of that those pollutants as dispersing, dispersing within this region here. It's going to keep most of those pollutants within that region. 
It's not going to be a whole lot of movement until you get more unstable atmospheric conditions to move up into that upper region. So let's look at an example. So we have a situation where we have a ground-based inversion. It's actually the example that I showed you for White Lake this morning. The ground level temperature is six degrees C. The temperature of the air increases with altitude at a rate of 0.1 degrees C per minute to an altitude of 120 meters. Above 120 meters, the lapse rate is minus 10 degrees per kilometer. So this is actually the lapse rate above that is the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Smoke is emitted from a wood burning stove. It leaves a chimney at a height of one of five meters with negligible velocity. And that's a, the reason we're using that is there's no plume rise. And we'll talk later about plume rise, but in this situation, we assume that the smoke is just emitted at five meters. And it's going to rise at the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So it's going to be essentially our, the hypothetic plume, the hypo, hypothetic balloon that we've been talking about, a hypothetical parcel of air. It's going to rise at that same rate. And you're asked to determine the mixing height of the smoke. So we have a situation here where let's plot this. So we have altitude in meters. <clears throat> And we have temperature, 20 degrees and 10. Our smokestack, that smoke is leaving at 20 degrees. And it's going to rise at the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So it's rising what we're told at the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Remember, it's five meters high, that chimney. So it would be 10 degrees <clears throat> at an altitude of 105 meters. The ground temperature is, so the ground temperature on the other hand is 10 degrees. It increases at 0.1 degrees C per meter up to 120, and then it's going to start to decrease. So that's the situation you're told. So Tz, the temperature of the smoke, is 20 degrees minus 10 degrees C per kilometer times Z minus 5. Okay. And the Z minus 5 is because we start The temperature of the air is 10, and it's going to cross before the, um, uh, the air temperature starts to increase. So we can see that from this diagram. And this is point 0.1 degrees C per meter times C. Okay. And we solve these two simultaneous equations. So we're looking at the point where Tz smoke equals Tz is the environmental lapse rate. So we'll solve for Z and that is equal to 90 1.4 meters. 
So where it would cross this would be at 91.4 meters. So what that means is this smoke then will disperse up to about 91 meters and it's gonna stay within this region here. It's gonna stay close to the ground level. So we're simply looking at the, this condition right here, solving for Z to determine the mixing height. Does that make sense? So it has to go over the problem statement slide again. So what you're told is that you have a ground-based elevation. The ground level temperature is 10 degrees and the temperature is increasing at a rate of 0.1 degrees C per meter to an altitude of 120. And then it starts to decrease at this rate here. So that is this situation here. We start at 10, it's increase, the temperature is increasing to 120 meters, and then it starts to decrease. And then you're also told the smoke is emitted from a stove, wood burning stove, and it's leaving at a height of one meter, and it's rising at the dry adiabatic collapse rate. So, Here's a chimney, it's at 20 degrees. So the temperature's at 20 degrees, it's five meters high. So the smoke is then leaving and the temperature is decreasing at the dry adiabatic collapse rate. So just write an equation for both of those lines. Solve for the altitude where the temperatures are equal, and that's this, that's C. Okay. It's helpful to draw the picture because you, you need to know, in this case, will it cross here or will it cross, because that's gonna affect which equation you use. So where you have a, a inversion like this, plot the data. And it also gives you, um, in my mind, a better picture, picture of the system. Does that help? A lot of these, my, my biggest advice is draw the, draw the diagram. We can also use ventilation coefficient to try and determine the extent to which the pollutant will dis <clears throat> disperse. And that's the maximum mixing by the average wind speed. If that value is less than about 6,000 square meters per second, that means that pollutant is not going to disperse readily and you've got a situation where you've got a high air pollution potential. So you've got a situation where your individuals are coughing and breathing all of this pollutant. Now, we need to recognize that wind speed changes with elevation. Typically, wind speed is measured at a height of 10 meters off the ground. So typically, the anemometer that's measuring wind speed is 10 meters off the ground. We can use this equation here to determine the wind speed at a height other than that of the anemometer. So u sub a is the height of the anemometer, uh, sorry, is the wind speed at the anemometer. Z sub a will typically be 10 meters. And then z2 is some other altitude, and then u2 is just the wind speed at that altitude. P is a dimensionless parameter that varies with atmospheric stability. And the values that we'll use are given here. So there's values for rough surfaces. This is typically in an urban environment or smooth surfaces, typically a rural environment. 
and this is just the value for the rough surface multiplied by 0.6. You can see that it varies with stability condition. So very unstable, you're gonna get a low P value and it approaches about 0.6 at a stable condition. We will use this set of data for the next actually through next week at least, when we're talking about transport. So in this case, we have a situation where we have an, atmos am <coughs> sorry, an atmospheric profile that is isothermal at 20 degrees C. You're asked, okay, you're told that the estimated maximum daily surface temperature is 25 degrees C. The anemometer is at one meter. In the city, it's rough terrain, and it measures three meters per second. And you're asked to estimate the mixing depth and the ventilation coefficient for moderately unstable conditions. So let's first look at the diagram. So again, we have altitude in meters and we have temperature. The, you're told that the ground temperature is 20 degrees C and it's isothermal, which means that it's not changing with altitude. The T max, is 25 degrees. And <clears throat> if we draw the dry adiabatic lapse rate line from that 25 degrees C, you see here, this would give us the mixing height. So we have a situation here, notice, in this region here, is the atmosphere stable or unstable? Here's my balloon. So it's unstable. Above, it's stable. Now, <clears throat> so what we have here, we need to determine <clears throat> the mixing height. So we have T, Z, or dry adiabatic lapse rate is equal to 25 minus 10 over 1,000, it's 10 degrees C per kilometer, over 1,000 meters per kilometer, times Z, and T, Z environmental lapse rate is equal to what is that equal to? Exactly, 20. <clears throat> so we'll set those two equal, solve for Z, and that is equal to 500 meters. I now need to determine U, and we have U2 over three meters per second, this is what was given, is equal to Z2 over 10 times P. So let's go back here. <clears throat> and we're, we'll have unstable conditions at, in that lower region. So, We'll use a P of 0.515. The question is, what do we use for Z2? Typically, your Z2 is equal to one half your mixing height. So that's typically what's used. In which case then, U2 is equal to 3.0 meters per second times 250 divided by 10 times 0.15, and that 
is equal to 4.86 meters per second. So the ventilation coefficient is equal to 4.86 meters per second times the 500 meters. And that is equal to 2,430 meters squared per second. So that tells us, do we have a lot of dispersion, not much dispersion? Do we have a condition where we have to be concerned with public health? What condition do we have? We're comparing that to that 6,000. So this is less than 6,000. So we have low dispersion, which means that we've got a high potential for high levels of air pollutants and potential for illness. Where was the 6,000 value again? Was that given in the problem statement or is that in the table? It's from right here. Okay. Thank you. So it's, ba it's basically just a criteria, but rule of thumb. It's not absolute. It doesn't mean that at 6,001, you're fine. And, you know, it just gives you some indication. The lower it is, the greater the potential for a high level, high levels of pollutants. The worse the, the conditions. Okay, thank you. So... Our little person here is coughing. Okay, so we've got a significantly less than that 6,000 value. So we need to be concerned. The last thing I'll mention are these um, graphs. <clears throat> Don't need to memorize these, uh, obviously, uh, although there are a couple problems where you'll need to look at doing some matching. Next time you look at a plume, you can actually look at the plume and get some sense of what the atmospheric condition is. So the adiabatic lapse rate is your dotted line. So it's this dotted line right here. In a condition here, where you have an unstable atmosphere. So your dry adiabatic lapse rate is greater than the environmental, you've got an unstable, and you will often see this kind of looping plume. In a condition where you have a stable atmosphere, you're more likely to have this coning so it's looking essentially like this. A lot, a lot of this really depends on um, the, el the altitude too of your smokestack. If your smokestack is here, where it's gonna cross over, basically, this is that neutral. So here's my smokestack. That plume is just gonna wanna stay right around there. It's not gonna wanna move up or down. So you get this kind of fanning and it's not moving. It may disperse horizontally, but it's not dispersing vertically. You can also have a, um, a lofting plume, in which case here it's rising but it's not moving down towards the surface. So it's actually protected. Essentially that person isn't, it's gonna disperse above, but not below. The worst case is here with the fumigation is it's dispersing below. So it's gonna to wanna to go down to the ground level and it's not gonna disperse above. So you're gonna get really high levels at that point below ground level or you can have a really complicated one that they refer to as trapping, which is somewhat similar to that fanning. So looking at a plume gives you some indication of the atmospheric condition or knowing the atmospheric conditions 
gives you some indication of the situation essentially on the ground for the pollutants. And we don't have time, so I'm not gonna play the little game at the end that I had here. It's actually, we were gonna do level two, but um, time-wise we won't. Um, so hopefully this gives you some sense of stability. You should be able to now do all of the meteorology problems. And then on Friday, we'll start taking this information and using it now to describe the transport of pollutants so that we can actually predict the concentrations on the ground. So happy to answer any questions.